we need to do a lot more because this war in Ukraine is going to go on. And even when it's over, we're going to have to support Ukraine. We're going to have to uh, restock our own supplies. And who knows you know, where the next crisis will come. <clears throat> the UK representative to NATO and the former UK national security advisor. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Steve. Was the, the, the Jets thing, let me just deal with this quickly. It felt to me like that was a bit of a con perpetrated on all of us because Zelensky was there, everyone was glad handing him, talking about, yes, fighter jets are on the table. But as we heard from Ben Wallace there, that's not a question of helping Ukraine in the short or even early medium term for this war. It's something for the future about their ongoing resilience. That's right. I mean, it was never going to be something we could do in the short term. When I was there in Westminster Hall when Zelensky came. Uh, he is such an effective persuader and he was on a campaign on fighter jets and nobody was going to say no to his face. And so everyone said, well, we'll think about it. We'll look at it. Nothing's off the table. But in reality, as the Defence Secretary said, um, supplying a squadron of modern fast jets is an enormous undertaking. Vast amounts of spares and stocks, lots of training, uh, experienced ground crews to support these things. This is not going to happen even in this year's fighting season, I don't think. So it's a longer term issue about resilience. And the short term is exactly um, keeping Ukraine going through the next fighting season, which is almost on us, given that Russia is on a war production footing and Britain and the West are not. And do we need to be? That seems to be the question um, here, Peter, that do we need to be starting to really ramp up production? Because we don't have very many ammunition reserves. Wallace was clear about that, that we were a bit... I mean, ammunition reserves are one of those things when you're not fighting a war, people think you can cut corners on a bit and say, well, save a bit of money there, we won't replenish it over there. And actually, we're a bit short. Do you think we need to go to what you'd call a war footing? I mean, it is the unglamorous end of the defence budget, isn't it? And politicians aren't always terribly interested in that. Uh, and you're right, we, we don't have the resilience. I mean, frankly, we have not been prepared to fight the kind of artillery duels that perhaps we remember last from the First World War, which are now going on in Ukraine, uh, and the Russians are. So I think, I don't mean we should uh, put the whole economy on a war footing, but our defence industries, we really ought to have had them on 24-7 working for the last nine months, actually, looking back. Um, because we ought to be now being able to pull in much larger stocks of ammunition, of anti-aircraft missiles, of anti-tank missiles, but setting up a new production line and actually getting equipment in through the, uh, through the door of the logistics depot um, is an issue of months, if not a year. So and, only starting now, we're behind the curve. And are they starting now? I mean, are, are we, do you think we are ramped up now as much as we should be? Where, where's, where's your sense of the urgency of it all? Well, I think the big message from this NATO defence meeting is that everyone around NATO is suddenly realising we need to do a lot more because this war in Ukraine is going to go on. And even when it's over, we're going to have to support Ukraine. We're going to have to uh, restock our own supplies. And who knows you know, where the next crisis will come. <clears throat> We've already seen the threat from China uh, in, the, in the ballooning crisis in China. So, yes, we need to durably put our defence industries onto a different footing. That will mean more defence spending. It will mean more resilience and thinking about um, logistics in defence is an absolutely key part of our national security. Let's talk briefly about the China balloon situation because uh, Wallace also said in, in that interview that he's having to have a review of this because there are apparently floating in the skies above us all sorts of balloons. They don't really know where they're from or what they're doing, particularly as they head out of airspace and sort of up into the just the, sort of the atmosphere before you get in, into space. Um, is that a concern? Do you think it's likely that, that, that there could be spy balloons all over the place that we don't know anything about? Well, it's the old adage, isn't it, that the more you look for, the more you find. Yeah. Uh, I think we haven't been particularly looking in the stratosphere for these balloons. They're difficult to spot on radar. They're small, they're slow moving. And I think nobody really thought that they were a threat. Bear in mind that we are under satellite observation all the time. Slightly spooky thought, but it's true. Um, the skies are full of uh, satellites taking pictures of us and other countries. Um, balloons are a slightly different thing. I don't think they add much capability in terms of observing what's going on on the ground, but they loiter around. And one of the most persuasive arguments I've heard for why the Chinese are doing this is that they sample air pressures and wind speeds at high altitudes, which could be very useful if it ever came to having to launch ballistic missiles and uh, target oh, them precisely. So, you know, they've got rather sinister uh, purposes. You could call that weather satellites, if you like. I mean, weather balloons, if you like. But it's, you know, it, there is a military... Uh, defense application here. And yes, I'm sure the more we look, the more we'll find in our skies. Many of them will be um, commercial. Uh, some of them will have escaped and be floating around on, on paths that were not intended. 
some may have these potential military applications and we need to be more vigilant in the future. Do we need to be more vigilant on China generally? Uh, the, the story that's around this morning is this notion that we use Chinese equipment. I mean, it's famously there in TikTok and people who use TikTok are sort of giving their information across effectively to the Chinese state. But in our institutional use of equipment, the police use uh, Chinese technology in cameras. Do, do you think there needs to be a complete look at that? I mean, is it ever safe to use Chinese what amounts to state-owned technology in our own institutions anywhere? Well, I think our whole attitude has changed in the last few years. There was a time not long ago when Huawei was the dominant pro provider <clears throat> of telecoms equipment, and now we're not putting in new Huawei equipment, although I think it's everywhere in our telecom system. Yes, absolutely, we need to be conscious of what these things are capable of. But the, um, you know, the, the manufacturing capacity in China means that, for example, anyone who has an Apple iPhone, that was probably manufactured in China. Yeah. Of course, to Apple Designs, but the factory was in China. So Chinese manufacturing is in everything we buy and everything we've installed. Where it comes to the more high-end technologies, um, yes, police surveillance cameras, certainly. We, I think we need to be very careful, and probably we need to be sourcing them from Western suppliers, even if they're more expensive in future. Yeah. Uh, just before you go, I don't want to become Ben Wallace's campaign secretary to be the, the next Secretary General of NATO. But You're getting I, close. I, I asked him the question, are you interested in the job? And he was very, very, I am a bit interested, yes. There were, he, was sort of, he lent into the non-denial denial. denial. Um, w would he make a good one? Do you think that's a viable option? Ben Wallace leaves Westminster and heads off, heads off to NATO. Well, when a politician does that, then you know he really is very, very keen on the job. Yes, I mean, yes he's a credible candidate. I think he's been a successful Defence Secretary. Britain has supplied, as you know, a number of you know, a very effective uh, NATO Secretary Generals, uh, George Robertson, Peter Carrington uh, in the past. Um, my feeling is probably that uh, NATO will want to look for a woman, actually, and that the Baltic states uh, in that area have never had a NATO Secretary General. So I think he'd be a strong candidate. I think he might find uh, quite a lot of opposition from some, some very good and effective uh, women who have sometimes been president of their country. Yeah. Uh, NATO is becoming a place where you have to have been a president or a prime minister in order to be secretary general. So I think Ben Wallace has got an uphill battle, but he's a very credible candidate. That's, yeah, and maybe the Baltic States is the place where you want to see the, the, the head of NATO as well. Uh, Peter, really interesting stuff as ever. Thanks for joining us. Your campaign continues. The campaign, I'm, I'm, I'm one step back there from Peter Ricketts, but uh, <laughs> we'll carry on. Peter Ricketts, Lord Ricketts there, former UK representative to NATO and the former UK national security advisor.